But let's talk a little bit more about where we stand with the coronavirus outbreak here in the U.S. and around the world. Let's bring in uh, Dr. Gregory Poland. He is a vaccinologist with the Mayo Clinic. Dr. Poland, great to hear from you um, once again. So um, I guess just talk us through, let's start at the highest level of where um, you see the outbreak right now, what our um, control looks like, what you think the next month looks like, because I think um, folks thinking from a purely economic standpoint are excited about what comes in May, but I think on the virus front, things don't really seem to be under a great amount of control nationwide. And Dr. Poland, if you could unmute yourself. Uh, there you go. I like the way Jennifer just said it. Uh, there's good news and bad news. There's a bifurcation. On the one hand, we're at almost 3.4 million uh, cases worldwide and 237,000 deaths. When you look at it, I was just tracing the numbers out. It took 90 days to get our first 100,000 cases, 12 days for the next 100,000, four days for the third one. Times in one human lifetime. And so those, those random. That sounds bad, but that's actually a flattening that's starting to happen. New York is actually a good example uh, of that flattening happening. The good news, I think, is that we're starting to see some bright spots, even this early, with the antiviral drugs. Remdesivir, in particular, had several announcements yesterday uh, showing a decrease in the time to uh, improvement. Those are really important uh, markers because those studies were done uh, you know, 12, 14 days into being sick. Imagine moving that to the left and being able to treat people with antivirals as early as we do, say, with influenza. And then the other thing is, that, of course, there's good advancement in progress in multiple vaccine fronts. So uh, it, it's an amazing thing that in 16 weeks, we've gone from zero to having an antiviral and talking about uh, vaccines in the near future. Let's dive in a little bit more on remdesivir. Uh, right now, uh, Gilead, and I know you're not a stock market person, but it is off. We've covered the earnings here last night. Uh, people are very interested in this drug. How, how optimistic and excited do you think people should be having looked at the studies yourself and also knowing what it would take in terms of the ramp up to get the supplies that would be needed to people. Yeah, I, I don't know what the company's plan is in terms of ramp up, but as you're pointing out, that's a critical question. Once you have something shown to be efficacious, there's going to be quite a demand for it. But, you know, we've got multiple human studies now, a non-human primate study, and they're basically, while not definitive, they're basically saying there's reason to be hopeful with this drug, very little in the way of toxicity associated with it. So we really need to wait. We need to get the bigger studies. They need to be placebo controlled, but they are showing even when they're being, when patients are being treated on the later side with it, they, they are showing that the time to clinical improvement and Shorter times on mechanical ventilation, et cetera, are very positive signals. Dr. Poland and Dan Roberts here. Uh, it sounds to me like there's some nice optimism about the vaccine, and, and you are sounding a little bit of an optimistic note in terms of flattening. But when you look at some of the states that are reopening already, there are obviously a number of concerns out there that some of these places are reopening either too early or now that they're reopening, they're reopening businesses too quickly. Of course, Georgia already under fire because it came out with the number of new cases it has had in the last 24 hours, as, as I understand it. And so what do you make of the states that are beginning to, to partially reopen? I mean, are they going too soon? And is there a risk of um, kind of fast regret here with, with reopening some of these states' economies? That's a really great question. Um, I think one of the mistakes that would be made is to say, well, we all do it at the same time or don't do it because the epidemiology varies so much by geography. Um, I, I actually like the way I see New York approaching this, where they're actually putting metrics around this. So uh, in New York, they're saying that you've got to have 30% of the hospital beds and ICU beds available. You have to have that reproductive number, what's called the R0, down below 1.1. You have to have PPE available. In other words, replenish your supplies and 
hospital rates suppressed. That makes sense to me in the context of seeing decreased community transmission. And not every locale is, is taking that, if you will, scientific and quantitative approach to reopening. Then the next part is doing it in phases, staggered. You open phase one, you wait two weeks to see if you're gonna see a surge. Then you go to phase two. Etc. The hard part about this is, you know, we're all tired of these social distancing measures. We're tired of being at home. We want to get back to work and to school. But to do that prematurely means to start this all over again. And Dr. Pollan, I just want to um, wrap up with a maybe a broader question about the, the virus itself and, and what we know about it now versus what we knew um, two months ago when, when this process really got rolling in the U.S., I mean, in terms of um, its stability, in terms of how much it's changing, what the difference is between strains that have come from Europe versus from Asia. I mean, where is our understanding on the virus? And just in your view, um, how do you feel like your understanding of, of you know, this coronavirus, which causes COVID-19, has changed in the last couple of months? Yeah, that's a really good question. You're putting your finger on, on what we worry about, which is basically the mutational rate of the virus and how is it changing and where is it mutating. Uh, actually, a very good article in the New York uh, Times earlier today uh, illustrating that graphically, and I think that's helpful for people to see. But the basic idea is that this virus, like all RNA viruses, acquires mutations, and that allows us to trace it. Who got infected where? The key question is, is the virus going to mutate in a way that makes it less virulent, no change, or even potentially more virulent? Will it, uh, by accumulating mutations, will antivirals not work or work better? Will it outmutate a vaccine? These are all unknowns right now. But what we can say is it is mutating, slowly so. None of the mutations to date have affected any of what we're doing with antivirals or vaccines, but we got to stay tuned. All right, uh, Dr. Gregory Poland with the Mayo Clinic. Uh, really appreciate the time and hopefully we can talk to you soon. My pleasure. Hey investors, Zach Guzman here. Are you interested in learning more about the markets and getting the latest financial news? Well then click right here to subscribe to our Yahoo Finance YouTube channel. Get the latest up to the minute market analysis, big interviews in the world of finance and information on how to manage your money every day wherever you are.